Solo, that was very beautiful. Very peaceful and relaxing. Put me to sleep. <laughs> it was a, friend, a favorite of the Fosters. So. <laughs> well, people of God, welcome home to worship, whether you're worshiping in person or online with us today. Hopefully, our line online will stay up and going. Um, we always pray for that, but technology has a mind of its own, so we shall see. Um, there are a few announcements to let you know about. Um, they're, they're printed in the back of the bulletin. Um, we'll celebrate All Saints, All Saints Sunday with Communion um, next Sunday. That's the day when we remember all of those saints who have gone before us, who have dedicated their lives to this church and to the ministry of God. We celebrate them and we remember them. Usually there is some form of um, interaction for us to write down names of, of people who have gone before us that have paved the way. Um, so there'll be something like that um, once I figure out what that's going to be. 
<laughs> so, um, our next PW meeting and lesson will be November 9th at 10.30 um, here at the church. And we'll be on lesson two. The one uh, announcement that I forgot to put in here is just to remind our elders that we do have a session meeting November 15th following worship. And hopefully at that time we will be looking at who our next class of elders will be, the class of 2023. Um, if you are a member of the church and you would like to serve as an elder, please let our committee know. The committee is made up of Todd Espinoza, Cindy Guerrero, and Betty Butler. And they will talk to you about kind of the ins and outs of session and what's what's uh, required and what, what, what you do. So uh, November 22nd um, is the, it, it's a Sunday, Sunday evening at 7 p.m. is the county or community ecumenical Thanksgiving worship service that um, all of us pastors get together and, and put on with the help of uh, leadership from different churches. Um, so you're invited to do that. Uh, Pastor Nate, he is the new minister at the Carn City Baptist Church. Um, and being the new minister, he gets to preach. Uh, apparently that is the rule. I learned that my first year. And I was like, oh, great. <laughs> um, so, that, so he gets to preach because he's the new one in town. Um, but if you would like to be able to go to that service, it's, it's going to be at, hosted by the Carn City Methodist Church this year. Um, again, it's at 7 o'clock. And then believe it or not, the first Sunday of Advent is November 29th. It is coming upon us. So if you need to shop for Christmas, you better get on it. <laughs> As commercials remind us. So. Are there any other announcements for this Sunday that we need to lift up? All right, let us um, join together in our call to worship. We do not gather in vain, for God is working in our hearts. Our worship strengthens and empowers us to share the gospel. Proclaim the good news with boldness. Please bow your heads in prayer with me. God, you are the giver of all good gifts. And you are the works of our hands. We pray, O oh God, that everything we have is a sign of your love, and everything that we do is a sign of your love. If we have strength, it is because you lift us up. When we have joy, it is on account of your grace. We praise you when you comfort us. We give thanks for your steadfast grace in times of judgment. With Christ to intercede, accept now our worship. May it be worthy of the care you show us. Amen. As you're able, I invite you to stand and we will sing our opening hymn, Take My Life, on page 697.
be seated. Now usually at this time in worship, we hear our call to confession and we confess our sins, but this Sunday is a little different. The PW Bible study lessons that we are doing are teaching us the art of lament and helping us reclaim how to lament the things in our our own lives and in the world and, and friends and families around us. And so that practice, she wants us to practice doing that. So as your pastor wanted to challenge the PW ladies, um, I'm not sure they were very thrilled, but <laughs> we're going to do it anyways. Um, I have invited them to write a lament for, so we will have a lament about the fourth Sunday of every month in place of a confession. Um, and they, the first one I told them I would do for them so that they have an example. Um, but the, it's the months after that, they will be up here leading their lament that they wrote. Um, and a, a, a way for us to connect what we're studying with worship as well. So this time I invite you to join me in our litany of lament um, as all the other ones. It's kind of a call and response. And so you will respond with the bold words. Let us pray our lament to God. My God, our God, God of all creation, we cry out to you in despair. We cry out to you, O God, from the depths of our soul. Hear our cries, do not be far away from our pain. Remain present with us, we pray. Look into the hearts of your people, see their struggles and pain. We bleed tears of sorrow as we are surrounded by the death of beloved pets and we see the loss of human life from a hidden virus. Even the earth cries out in pain as she is devoured by raging fires and floods. Hear us, O Lord. See us, O Lord. Help us, O Lord. How long, O Lord, will you let us suffer before we feel the presence of your righteous right hand, or see your light and hope emerge. We open our souls for you to pour us with light and bring us up out of the depths of the darkness with your righteous right hand. We know that darkness is not dark to you, Creator God, for it is, for it is like the light of day. We have comfort and peace. Knowing that you have followed your promises, we are to be our hope and deliver. My God, our God, God of all creation, wipe away our tears, lift our burdens, blanket us with warmth and the assurance of your presence and love, we pray. I invite you now to spend a few moments in personal silence for any personal laments you might want to add. Amen. I invite you now to join me in our response to lament. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us.
Let us pray. Almighty God, in you are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Open our eyes that we may see the wonders of your word and give us grace that we may clearly understand and freely choose the way of your wisdom through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Old Testament reading this morning comes from the book of Deuteronomy, the 34th chapter, verses 1 through 12. I invite you to hear the living and active word from our Lord this morning. Then Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo, to the top of Pishgah, which is opposite Jericho. And the Lord showed him the whole land, Gilead as far as Dan, all Naphtali, all, la all the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, and all the land of Judah as far as the Western Sea, the Negev and the plain that is the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees, as far as Zoar. The Lord said to him, this is the land which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I have let you see it with your eyes, but you shall not cross over there. Then Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab at the Lord's command. He was buried in the valley of the land of Moab opposite Beth Peor, but no one knows his burial place to this day. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His sight was unimpaired and his vigor had not abated. The Israelites wept for Moses in the plains of Moab for 30 days. Then the period of mourning, mourning for Moses was ended. Joshua, son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom because Moses had laid his hands on him and the Israelites obeyed him, doing as the Lord commanded Moses. Never since has there arisen a prophet in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. He was unequaled for all the signs and wonders that the Lord sent him to perform in the land of Egypt against Pharaoh and all his servants and his entire land. And for all the mighty deeds and all the terrifying displays of power that Moses performed in the sight of Israel. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our New Testament reading comes from Paul's first letter, and this is actually one of the oldest letters known that Paul wrote, and most likely the first one he wrote. And this is the first letter of two that he wrote to the church in Thessalonica. We will be reading from chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. Again, I invite you to hear the living and active word from our Lord. You yourselves know, brothers and sisters, that our coming to you was not in vain, but though we had already suffered and been shamefully maltreated at Philippi. As you know, we had courage in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in spite of great opposition. For our appeal does not spring from deceit or impure motives, or trickery, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the message of the gospel, even so we speak not to please mortals, but to please God, who tests our hearts. As you know, and as God is our witness, we never came with words of flattery or with the pretext of greed nor did we seek praise from mortals, whether from you or from others, 
though we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were, were gentle among you, like a nurse tenderly caring for her own children. So deeply do we care for you that we are determined to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also ourselves, because you have become very dear to us. This is the word of the Lord. Speak to God. Let us pray. Gracious and holy God, we have heard your word read to us from holy scriptures. And we ask that as your word is proclaimed, that they not be my words, but they be your words, and that they fall upon all of us here this day to nourish us, to support us, to challenge us to go out into the world and share your message with others. May these words be pleasing and acceptable to you this day. We pray in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who is our rock and our redeemer. Amen. What outcomes have you hoped for in your life? What goals have you set for yourself? Most businesses have a goal for sales or customer service or the growth of the business. Some personal goals for your own lives might include weight loss or getting that promotion at work or even traveling around the world during retirement. We tend to arrive at our outcomes and goals through the actions that we take in our lives. The choices we make will either hinder or advance our efforts at reaching our desired outcomes. But what if I told you that the outcome is not always determined by our actions? Let me explain using Moses as an example. In the text from Deuteronomy, we hear that Moses is not allowed to enter the promised land. After 40 years of wandering in the desert, hearing the complaints of the people over and over again, pleading with God on behalf of the people, seeing a glimpse of God's backside, receiving the Ten Commandments, and so many more actions, Moses is only allowed to stand on the edge of the mountain and see the promised land, but he is not allowed to enter. Rather, he dies at the age of 120, on the edge of the land which was promised long ago to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The outcome Moses experiences is not determined by the actions he took. When it comes to God and faithfully living in accordance to the gospel, the outcomes we have in mind may not be the outcomes that God has in store for us. When God first called Moses through the burning bush, he did not call Moses for Moses to enter the promised land himself. Rather, Moses was called to lead the people out of slavery and make it known to the people who the God of Israel truly is. Jill Duffield, who is the editor for the Outlook magazine, says this, God calls in our, God's call and our commitment to the one who calls us moves us forward whether we enter the promised land, only see it on the horizon, or remain in the wilderness another 40 years. She goes on to say that the focus of our faithfulness is not success or a benchmark, but God. 
when we recognize this truth, our relationship to the one who calls us takes priority over the outcome of our efforts. Paul knew this well as he writes his first letter to the church in Thessalonica. Paul and his missionary companions open this portion of the letter telling the Thessalonian people that they do not come preaching the gospel of good news because they are going to get any personal success out of it. In fact, Paul has outlined for them that they arrived in Thessalonica after having been mistreated and imprisoned in Philippi for preaching the word of God. However, they continue this journey of spreading the good news of the gospel because they have been called by God to do so. They come in spite of great opposition. Their message has been approved by God, and they have been entrusted by God to share this news. Paul is placing a firm dividing line between himself and other traveling philosophers. Other traveling philosophers of Paul's day would proclaim a message about the gospel but do so in deceitful ways. Ways that only served to make them successful or ways that were manipulative for the purposes of personal gain. This is not unlike some tele-evangelists of our own day whose proclamation always ends up with a call to contribute money to their televised program. Money that goes directly into the pockets of the televangelists, pays for the mansions they live in, the fancy cars they drive, and is not used for any ministry or mission of the church. Paul wants the people to know that what he is doing is not for any personal gain. The message he brings is a message with, with which he has been entrusted to speak not to please mortals, but to please God who tests our hearts. Every word Paul speaks is a message that he knows is from God. That message will be a message that does not always sit right with the hearers of the word. But it is a message that God wants or needs the people to hear. If you pay close attention to the prayer that I pray before I begin the sermon, you will always hear me say these words. Let these words be yours, O God, and not my own. And let them fall upon each of us this day to support us, nourish us, and challenge us. And may these words be pleasing and acceptable to you, O oh God, this day. Sermons are never my word. They are always heavily influenced by the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. Many times I will have an outcome in mind for a sermon, a place I think the sermon needs to go, but inevitably, the sermon always ends up somewhere else. I can take actions of reading certain commentaries that might support my planned outcome, think about the needs of the church, contemplate world events in relation to the word for the week, but my planned outcome will always be drastically different. We are called to preach and evangelize not for our own personal fulfillment, nor to please any human being, but to please God only, and to spread the good news. You may have heard of the prosperity theology. It is a theology that inaccurately espouses a belief that God wills financial blessing and physical well-being upon individuals 
And if we engage in faith, positive speech, and donations to religious causes, it will increase one's material wealth. Now, God does will for us to be happy and healthy and have the means by which to live in the world, but not at the expense of others. All throughout Scripture, one will find that anyone with blessings from God is to use them to close the gap between the rich and the poor, to point out acts of injustice, to clothe the naked, to feed the hungry, to visit the sick and imprisoned, give water to the thirsty, to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with our God. It is this message that Paul seeks to tell his readers. A word of God that makes Paul unpopular at times throughout his ministry. Generally speaking, people do not want their sins pointed out to them. They don't necessarily want to be challenged to live differently according to God's will. They want a feel-good message that is meant to lift up their spirits and assure them of their blessings, not a message that challenges their comfortable way of living. They want to hear a message about their own wealth and health instead of a message that condemns them for not living out the greatest commandment of loving God with all of your heart, all of your soul, and all of your mind, and loving your neighbor as yourself. In this letter, Paul also wants to assure the people that, he, that as he gives them this God-approved message, that he does so as a person who deeply cares for them, for their spiritual life, and for their faithfulness as a people of God. He will care for them like a nurse tending to her own children. Paul is determined not only to share the gospel with them, but to share his own self. He says, so deeply do we care for you that we are determined to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you have become very dear to us. This is exactly what God did for us as well. In the Feasting on the Word commentary, it shares this quote. Sharing selves is what God did in Jesus Christ. Christians who are the body of Christ are called to nurture others with tender care and shared vulnerability. A God-approved message will consist of genuine care, speaking the truth in love. It will be aimed at pleasing God and not ourselves, and it will not be spoken for one's own personal gain or out of deceit or manipulation. A God-approved message will have an outcome that our actions do not necessarily determine. A God-approved message will be hard to preach, hard to speak, and hard to live. It will come with pushback from others, and it will at times be difficult to live out. But anything contrary to this is not God's approved message, but rather words of a vain and empty pursuit. The famous composer, Johann Sebastian Bach, gotta get that in there. <laughs> he is known to have signed all of his compositions with the initials SDG, which stands for Solia Deo Gloria, to God alone be the glory. May our actions, our spoken words, our very lives be lived to the glory of God alone. This is God's word for us today. Amen.
I invite you now to stand and we will affirm our faith using the Apostles' Creed, which is printed in the bulletin. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born under the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He descended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And from thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. <coughs> I invite you, as you would like, you can place your offerings in the offering plate, which is right by the door as you come in and as you leave. But I also, during this time, while Stella plays some music, I invite you also to think about how you yourself can be an offering with your gifts that God has given you. resources to share, money and energy, time and creativity, skills and talents. We offer you these gifts. We offer you our lives. May these gifts and our lives bring blessings to our sisters and brothers near and far. As we go into our prayer for the prayers of the people, I invite you, if you have any joys or concerns that you would like to lift up, you may do so at this time. Yes. Yesterday, I celebrated my family and friends and pastor my 80th birthday celebration, actually Friday. And it was wonderful. It's wonderful to be 80, you youngins. <laughs> I looked around and I thought, oh my goodness, I'm the senior person here. But it, it was a wonderful experience and I was so taken away. There's a big 80s balloon arrangement in my front yard and I was so taken back. I said, well, I can't lie about my age anymore. But I did not realize the parade was in my honor until we were about halfway through. And I thought, I wonder what we're celebrating. And then, you know, people just kept saying, Happy birthday. And I thought, Oh my word, how did they do this? You know. So um, they do that in, in a small town, they could do that, <laughs> I'm told. But it was a wonderful, wonderful day. And thank everyone for, for the love that was shared. Yes, happy birthday. Thank you. It was also, it was fun to be in the parade. <laughs> Being led by the fire trucks and the police, you don't necessarily get that in a big city where I'm used to living, so it's pretty cool. 
but it was wonderful to be able to celebrate your special day. But let us go to the Lord in prayer. Our shepherd who satisfies our needs, in faith we pray to you, O Lord. We pray for the church. Entrust to us the message of your gospel so that we may share your good news through simple kindness and tender words. O oh Lord, our God, we pray for the earth. How long, O oh Lord, will your creation suffer? Let the work of our hands be a blessing, not a curse to the world that you have made. We pray for all nations, God of glory. Lift up leaders who delight in our law, the people who rejoice in what is right. Let them prosper like trees bearing good fruit. O oh Lord, our God, we pray for this community. By your wisdom, show us what it means to live according to your justice and mercy and to love our neighbors as ourselves. We pray for loved ones, healing God. Bless and keep your faithful servants who have come at last to their life's end. Give them a clear vision of your promised land. O oh God, we especially lift up to you this day the joys and also concerns that have either been spoken aloud or remain in our hearts. We give you great joy that we get to celebrate Wish's 80th birthday. The gifts and the joy and the patience and the calmness that she brings to our lives and to this church is a blessing and an honor. Continue with her in good health that we may celebrate many more years to come. O oh God, we pray for those who are worshiping at home, for those who are homebound and cannot get out. Fill them with the presence of your Holy Spirit and connect us to them through the Holy Spirit's power, knowing that we do not worship alone, but we worship as one body of Christ wherever we are at. Loving shepherd, lead and guide us in green pastures and by still waters, in right paths and through dark valleys, until we feast with you in glory and dwell in your house forever. And now we pray as your son taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Then I invite you as you're able to stand and we will join in singing our closing hymn, Jesus, Jesus, fill us with your love. It's on page 203.
go forth from this building, go forth as the body of Christ, knowing that God has given you the message to spread in this world. Do so with a loving heart, so others may know the joy and the love that we experience as well. And as you go, may joy and nothing less find you on the way. May you be blessed and be a blessing. May you show God's love to all who you meet. And may the light of God shine through you, follow you, and lead you all the way home. Amen.